Hey, how you doing, man? All right. I want to man. welcome you to the show. We have horror icon here, Bill Mosley on Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max. He's the one who brings the Christmas candy and the devil's brandy. You may know him as Otis Driftwood and House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, Three from Hell, Chop Top, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Horror icon here, Bill Mosley. Bill Mosley, how are you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> go, go Red Men. I used to, I used to follow uh, Red, uh, St. John's basketball when Luke Conoseca was coaching. Really? I got the chance yeah. to interview him a couple months ago. He's a gem. One of the nicest people you ever meet. Great. Fantastic, man. Who was your yeah. favorite Red Men of all time? Uh, I was happy Mullins. Mullins? Yeah. 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 Legendary. He was, he was so much fun. Legendary. Yeah. Actually, if you think about it, you started out as a freelance writer, writing for Omni magazine. So we have the journalism thing in common. Yes, I was just, I was, in fact, I was just reminding my wife and uh, the uh, boyfriend of my older daughter about uh, some of the Omni interviews I did. I did some great ones. I, I interviewed Linus Pauling. I interviewed, well, Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, but that was for Psychology Today magazine. Uh, so a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, good, crazy, cool interviews. Uh, I love science. So that was really my, uh, when I was uh, just about to graduate, they started giving out, they started uh, including courses in the curriculum at college called, uh, you know, something for the non-scientists. So I took black holes and quasi-stellar phenomenon for the non-scientists. Then I took quantum mechanics for the non-scientists. And uh, that kind of got me into it. And, uh, you know, it got me into the idea of uh, trying to take science that might be a little obtuse for a lot of people and uh, try to turn it, turn it into layman's terms so that people could understand just what kind of cool stuff was going on uh, in those labs. Mm -hmm. Graduated uh, with an English degree at Yale. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I read online that you were born in Stanford. Is that correct? Yeah. Really? Because I'm, I'm from Connecticut and I went to okay. high school in Stanford, Connecticut. Fantastic. Yes, I actually, I grew up in, uh, you know, my first couple of years were spent in New Canaan. Okay, that's back close. In, uh, back in the early 50s, uh, when I was born, uh, I guess New Canaan didn't have a hospital. So I was, uh, I was born in Stanford. Yeah. You made your way out to Illinois, Midwest. Yes. And in fact, I was supposed to be born on Halloween. That was my due date, but um, which would have been appropriate. But I stayed in until uh, November 11th, which is Armistice Day. So from a monster to a peace child, but uh, you know that's that's my journey. <laughs> <laughs> you're also you're South Illinois. Yes, you're also a musician, Corn Bucks, in your own band. Uh, yeah. Well, that was a band I had with uh, the world's greatest guitar player, uh, Buckethead. Mm -hmm. um, Buckethead and I, and uh, and a drummer named Pinchface was uh, that was the trio was Corn Bucks. And uh, but I started off actually in Barrington with my two brothers. We were the Mosley Brothers band. Mm -hmm. And then um, we were called the Moes because I actually tried to put Mosley Brothers band on our on my bass drum. I was the drummer, and so I had black tape, and I tried to put it and make our name on the bass drum. And I wrote the Moes, and then ran out of black tape, so it, we became the Moes, but it's short for the Mosley Brothers. And then uh, Corn Bugs. Um, then I did was in a band uh, called Spider Mountain with a. Uh, a uh, guy named Ronnie Sharon, who was in a band called Stolen Babies, still is. And his twin brother, Gil Sharon, plays drums for Marilyn Manson. Awesome. So we put out an album, Spider Mountain, uh, No Way Down. And, uh, and then um, uh, more recently, I was uh, I did a uh, an EP with uh, Phil Anselmo of uh, Pantera. And That's that great. is called uh, Bill and Phil, Songs of Darkness and Despair. Uh, which is really kind of tongue in cheek. It's not really neither. Well, it's kind of dark, but it's, there's no despair in it. Uh, and now I'm actually back doing something again with uh, Ronnie. So we're about to put out another Spider Mountain CD. Congratulations on that. Did you get the chance to meet Marilyn Manson? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. A couple of times. I was actually, I was at uh, Twiggy Ramirez, you know, his bass player, his erstwhile bass player. I was at his wedding. And uh, Marilyn was one of the best, I guess he was his best man. So I met him at Twiggy's wedding. Um, and then also, of course, I've worked with Rob Zombie. And so on occasion, we get to go backstage. And I certainly met him backstage at a couple of Rob's concerts. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the Twins of Evil. So Rob and Marilyn's concerts. 
before we get into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and the, the Texas Chainsaw Manicure, I want to get into what was your introduction into horror as a viewer or even even better and interesting for the audience, what was the first horror movie that frightened you? Well, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, uh, I would have to say that uh, one of the first movies I remember seeing, uh, well, the, probably the first movie um, would have to be when uh, Granny, my mother's mother, uh, when I was visiting her in uh, New York City back in like 50, I guess it was either 56 or 57. Uh, and Granny, I'm sure at my, you know, I, I pestered her and she, so she took me to a, uh, uh, a, a showing, uh, you know, first round showing of uh, The Blob with Steve McQueen. And that just scared the crap out of me. Um, I also remember seeing uh, my mom and I pestered her when we were in Northern Illinois. She took me to Crystal Lake. No, you know, no Jason Voorhees in sight, but she took me to Crystal Lake, Illinois, which isn't far from, from where I grew up. And uh, we went to see a uh, double feature of The Fly and The Return of the Fly. And uh, that scared the crap out of me. Um, and then the other movie I remember seeing early as a kid was um, one of the kids in my grade school. Uh, his father worked was the editor of Downbeat Magazine, which I never knew about, but it's a jazz magazine. <clears throat> we went to this kid's house for Halloween, a bunch of kids. and. Um, and the father uh, showed, got the, uh, you know, eight, 16 millimeter camera, and, you know, pull up the screen and showed us a creature from the Black Lagoon. So I remember that too. So those are, those are around that. That was, those are, you know, my starter. That's my starter kit right there. <laughs> Classic films and the blob. Yeah. Steve McQueen years later, you would actually play a small role in the remake in 1988. Yeah. Yeah. And very, very, very happily. Um, it was my first job, actually, when I moved from, uh, when I did, uh, change, after I did Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, uh, back in 86, um, I was encouraged to uh, try out this acting thing. And, uh, you know, um, I, I certainly loved uh, writing for magazines, uh, but, um, you know, it was just, uh, I don't know, it was a, it was a great time to, you um, you know, leave the magazine writing profession, the freelance writing profession. And, um, and I was, I was psyched. I thought, boy, you know, yeah, I'd like to, you know, who wouldn't want to, you know, go to Hollywood. And I was, uh, when I was on the set of Chainsaw 2, uh, the writer, Kit Carson's agent, uh, was the one that said, hey, you're pretty good at this. You ought to come to Hollywood. And of course, that's all I needed to hear. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, that was just, uh, you know, a crazy suggestion, like, uh, hey, you know, you're pretty good, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty good uh, on your feet, you ought to try for Major League Baseball. <laughs> I was like, well, you, know, you do have some other steps in between there. But, uh, you know, I was kind of dumb and just went, sure, okay. So I took my then pregnant girlfriend and we, uh, we headed west and uh, landed in Hollywood in 80, I guess toward the end of 86. And uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the Blob was one of my first Hollywood movies. Um, it was really cool because uh, I auditioned for it. I auditioned for Chuck Russell, our uh, director. And, um, and I took a page from uh, Caroline Williams, who plays Stretch in uh, Texas Chainsaw 2, uh, told me how she got the part back in Austin, Texas. She, um, you know, she, Toby Hooper, our director, and Kit Carson, the writer, were in the little room waiting to see, like, next, you know, next girl to see who is, uh, you know, auditioning for Stretch. And, uh, and Caroline had a plan, and she ran into the room, and she was like, he's coming! And she slammed the door, and she went over and grabbed the chairs out from under Kit and Toby and stacked them against the door. <laughs> you know, she's like, he, he, he lives on fear. They live on fear. You know, and doing this whole thing and really including them in a very, you know, energetic audition, which got her the part. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for me, I, I did kind of that. I took the, kind of that page of, you know, the blob. I had, uh, I got a soldier number one, two, or three. One of the, there was an amp, you know, number or something, soldier number two, maybe. And, um, you know, and I had to, uh, you know, say I had to come back. I've just seen the blob engulf a couple and melt a couple of my, uh, my fellow soldiers. Mm -hmm. So I turned to Kevin, Kevin, uh, uh, 
and say, uh, I say, it got them, Bigelow and Wilson. They were inside trying to scream, you know, and I was kind of into it and I got it, you know, next to the door and everything. And, and the director looked at me and said, uh, you know, can you, uh, Kevin Dillon, sorry, uh, can you uh, start tomorrow? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and so I remember driving back into Los Angeles uh, from Valencia, where the audition was. And, uh, and my, you know, my girlfriend and our then maybe two or three year old little girl uh, formed a rumble line and started going, I got a job on the blob. Yeah. I got a job on the blob. Yeah. So it was very exciting. That was my first, and it was supposed to be one day's work, but um, one of uh, one of the stars kept, you know, getting, getting these minor injuries. So one day turned into three. So it was very exciting to, uh, you know, have three days pay versus one day's pay. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw Manicure. This was a tape that you wanted to, Hope to get on Saturday Night Live. Eventually, Toby Hooper got wind of it. He got the tape. Steven Spielberg, I believe, also viewed the tape as well and loved your performance because you took heavy inspiration from Ed Neal, the hitchhiker from yes, the original yes. 1974 Absolutely. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yep. Yeah, I was, I was actually on a ranch uh, in the summer of 84, and I was working with a crazy kid uh, who uh, was really, you know, pounding a lot of sugar. And uh, he would have... Uh, you know, lots of sugary juice, like bug juice in the morning and fudge sickles and Mars bars and frosted flakes and just pound that sugar as like a 16 year old. And um, when we would go outside to do our manual labor on the ranch, sun would kind of bake down on his head and he would go into what I call sugar deliriums. And um, he would sing top 40 songs. He would do character voices from cartoons and commercials and crazy, you know, jingles. And, uh, and I would pretty much turn a deaf ear to him. But one day we were working side by side and he was going, oh, Captain Crunch, Captain Crunch, you know, doing his thing. And, um, and then all of a sudden he said, Texas Chainsaw Manicure. And then back to Captain Crunch and his crazy voices. And I was like, whoa, I heard it. And uh, it just, it just I, I heard it. It was like a, the voice of God. <laughs> 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 I went back to the bunkhouse and I wrote out like a five minute scenario. A woman goes to a beauty parlor, et cetera, et cetera. And she wants a manicure eventually. And out comes another face. And uh, so I came back to New York city and I um, actually shot that. I shot the manicure on Staten Island mm -hmm. um, at a place called Sonia's hair fashions. And I had a friend of mine, Lori Frank, who directed it. I wrote the thing and produced it and, and, and gave myself a cameo at the very end of it. Um, and so woman goes in, gets her hair done, you know, is underneath the dryer. I think I'll have a manicure and the beautician calls back manicure. And you hear the saw rubbing up in the back of the shop. And this, of course, the sliding steel door, a la, you know, homage to a uh, chainsaw, Texas chainsaw massacre. Mm -hmm. And out comes Leatherface with a smoking chainsaw. <laughs> and, uh, this poor woman is kind of pinned under the dryer and she's like, oh, and, uh, and he's kind of smoking toward her and he comes over and starts sawing on her hands and she's screaming and sawing away and screaming and she passes out. And when the beautician slaps her face and brings her, you know, to uh, you know, the poor woman's like, no, no, no. Uh, uh. And she's got a fabulous manicure. <laughs> and uh, so she then she goes out to the truck where her husband is uh, waiting in the pickup. And it was me, you know, with the, the wine mark dressed as Ed Neal uh, from Chains, the original Chainsaw. Mm -hmm. And she goes, look, honey, I got the best manicure ever. And I go, hey, that's great, honey. We should celebrate with some head cheese. And I'd gone out and bought some head cheese. It, was, it didn't look very dramatic, but if you read the ingredients, you would like, oh, dude. Uh, but anyway, so uh, that was my 22nd cameo. Uh, a friend of mine was actually... Um, uh, a writer, he had already written a, a successful screenplay called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Mm -hmm. And uh, he and his partner had an office across the hall from Toby Hooper and, and Steven Spielberg. And um, I think it was at Paramount, Toby, I think they were teamed up to do Poltergeist at the time. And my, I, showed it, I showed the manicure to my friend all five minutes of it. And uh, he said, well, if you give me a copy of this, I'll walk it into Toby Hooper. And I was already a big debt for this thing. I was, you know, I found out if you're the producer, you're the one that owes the money to everybody. 
And uh, I was I was in you know desperate shape. And uh, but anyway, I thought, OK, well, you know, if Toby likes it, wouldn't that that would at least be some victory because uh, I was such a big fan of, of the original Chainsaw. And um, so my friend, I said, sure, I gave him a VHS copy. He walked it in. Toby saw it, called in Steven Spielberg, according to Toby. And uh, they both loved it. And they both loved my performance as the hitchhiker. And uh, I got Toby's home number. I called him up. I said, you know, I identified myself. And, and um, he said, yeah, I, I love the manicure Bill now who, who played the hitchhiker. I said, well, that was me. And he said, well, if I ever do a sequel, I'll keep you in mind. And uh, two years later, you know, I got the call to, uh, to play Chop Top in uh, Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Mm -hmm. Based on that, you know, I didn't audition for it. I wasn't, you know, I didn't even have an agent. I wasn't really, I was no. a writer. I wasn't in the acting game. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how I got the job. And that, of course, led to this 35 year career. Yeah, right. this is the role that puts you on the map. And yeah. uh, there was uh, the good news was that you're getting paid a lot more than what you were magazine articles. And the, the bad news was the uh, shaving your head. <laughs> yeah, which and, you know, you can see, I mean, it, it, it grew back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, actually, what that wasn't well. The bad it was bad news. According to my agent, she said, "Well, the good news is you're gonna, you got the part. Uh, the bad news is you're only gonna get scale plus ten okay. or scale. I think like SAG minimum." And I said, "Well, geez, what is that?" And and as a freelance writer, I was probably averaging about three hundred dollars a week in New York City, which you know, fortunately, I had it. My my rent was two hundred eighty dollars a month on the Upper West Side. <laughs> good old days. Uh, so you know. I could get by on three hundred dollars a week, but um, you know, and I said, "Well, geez, how much is scale?" It just sounded like I thought of a fish. You know, what is scale? And she said, "Ah, oh, it's like I don't know. I think it's seventeen hundred a week." It's like, yeah, I think I can handle that. <laughs> and then she said, "You know, plus they want you to shave your head because you got a plate in your head." And I said, "Well, sure, no problem." She said, "So I told them since you're a working actor, you wouldn't be able to work until your hair grew back. So they've agreed to pay you five thousand dollars to shave your head." And I thought, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's the bad news. I mean, come on. Oh, dog will hunt. <laughs> dog will hunt is right. Classic. I want to hear the story behind the scene of the dinner scene, because that's my favorite scene of the movie in part two. Well, uh, you mean kind of the grand finale? The shoot, the shoot yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that was actually, uh, you know, a lot of fun. We we worked very hard. That was when uh, we have Grandpa. You know, we're bringing in Grandpa. We've got Caroline. She's you know beaten and you know delirious. She's tied. She's tied to the armchair, literally the armchair, with some arms on it. Uh, and uh, poor. And now we're we're going to introduce her to Grandpa. And uh, the cook, uh, the cook's idea is that we're going to sacrifice her to Grandpa because Grandpa is 140 years old and. You know, he lives on a, a strict liquid diet, meaning, of course, human blood. And uh, and here's Bubba, you know, Leatherface, who loves her and, you know, is he's torn. He's torn between loyalty to the family and, of course, uh, it's this love he has for, for Stretch. And um, so we, uh, so Stretch is sitting at the dinner table and in comes, uh, you know, we bring in Grandpa on a little rickshaw. And uh, we bring Stretch over and kneel her down. She's got her head over a, you know, a basin. And, uh, and we put the, 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 the hammer, the head hammer into uh, Grandpa's unsteady hand. <laughs> He's trying to, <laughs> trying to bang her on the head like the good old days. And he kept, keeps dropping the hammer. Uh, and he finally does you know, hit her a little bit. And you know, we're trying to get a little of that uh, slurpy booty into a ladle, <laughs> into Grandpa's gross mouth and uh, right then of course is when Dennis Hopper joins us and uh, you know really jumps into the living room and uh, that starts uh, the big chainsaw fight which uh, is basically it's it's uh, the chainsaw fight is Leatherface and Dennis Hopper they have their chainsaw fight I in the meanwhile Stretch gets up and starts running so I'm chasing Stretch uh, through our labyrinthine alp our little fake mountain in which we live and uh and i get her up on to uh you know she runs up the stairs out into the, the daylight and then she runs into the top of the alp 
And uh, that is uh, what we call chainsaw heaven. And that's where our grandma is. And, uh, and I, I think I've got her cornered now and, you know, I'm really getting ready. Dead end to, city. Uh, yeah. Cut my, cut my throat, you know, like death eating a cracker and do all this stuff. And, and then of course she discovers that there is a chainsaw in grandma's lap. And so she yanks it free. And of course, in the process, grandma crumbles to bits. <laughs> grandma's, yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> we don't know if we don't, we, in the Sawyer family, we don't care if they're alive or dead. They're still family. That's why I carry nubbins around. We got grandma, not really sure. Grandpa's kind of alive, but he's 140. I mean, so uh, the line between life and death is really blurred with the Sawyer family. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, she, you know, rank, yanks that chainsaw and I'm, I'm working on her back with my straight razor and she yanks, starts that chainsaw and then guts me and out I fall and down a tunnel, down a smoky hole. And that's the last we see of Chopped Up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ringing in bad. the sheet. Too bad, by the way. <laughs> oh, ringing in the sheet. I, yeah, I was hoping, I really was hoping that we would revive Chop Top someday, but uh, no such luck. Yeah, no, it's unfortunate. All American Massacre, we never got to see, see that, unfortunately. But you never know. There's always all these remakes, and you were actually in the Texas Chainsaw 3D that came out a couple years ago, and Trey Songs was in it. Yeah, and that's actually why we opened number one that one weekend. The weekend that we opened, we were the number one box office. And there were some other, some pretty big movies. I can't remember quite which they were, but they, I think there was a Tarantino, maybe it was Django. There was a Lord of the Rings movie. I mean, there was a lot of competition. And, and because of Trey, for the most part, you know, we opened number one. That was kind of the first time when the internet kind of sold the movie. Um, but yes, but I... Uh, and now the producer, Carl Massacone, called me up and said, we're going to make this check Texas Chainsaw 3D, and, and we want you to play the cook. And I said, well, the cook, I mean, you know, dude, I mean, I was Chop Top, you know, Chop Top. And he goes, yes, I know you were Chop Top, but we don't have the rights to Chop Top. Uh, we have the rights to the original uh, and the characters in the storyline of the original, but you were actually in number two, and that, and that is owned by another company and so we don't own the rights to Chop Top. So we want you to play the cook. And I was thinking, well, geez, if anybody's going to play the cook, it should be me because I love Jim. I had a great relationship, personal relationship with Jim Cedow and his wife, Ruth. We exchanged Christmas cards after Chainsaw 2. You know, we were buddies and uh, talked on the phone and stuff. So I was, I was glad to actually, uh, you know, get that gig and uh, worked really hard to try to get his quirky body movements down. You know, I, I didn't I didn't really know how weird he was. I mean, I, I knew he was weird <laughs> because, of course, you know, we worked together. <laughs> and he had a wonderful, endless trove of dirty jokes. He really had an amazing, I mean, he really, I was really impressed. Um, but anyway, uh, be that as it may. So what they did was, um, you know, uh, he was, uh, he had a weird way of walking and he would kind of, I, I couldn't quite get it until I figured out that he, when he walks, he kind of, he he's pulls his, his, his shoulders back and he thrusts his pelvis forward. So it's like, hey, boy, you know, and, he, and, uh, and so then I, I, once I got the body, I, I started getting that. And then the, the voice came like, look what your brother did to the door, you know, and that started to come. Um, and then the producer said, well, and we've got you a fat suit to play the character. And I said, well, why? Because, you know, Jim, Jim was a gaunt man. And uh, the producer said, no, no, he was, he was, uh, he, he was port portly, <laughs> you know? And, and I was, I was about to say, and I just said, shut up, Bill. You know, that's, that's how I've lasted this long. <laughs> you know, I want to <laughs> shut up, Bill. I was like, okay. Uh, so they gave me this bat suit, which was a couple of t-shirts with cotton in between them. And, and we shot this down in Louisiana in the summer, and it was so hot and that um, the fat suit soon, because I sweated so much, it soon turned into, it felt like I was wearing a Kevlar vest. It was so heavy and thick, but, uh, you know, I'm, you know it's, they're, 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 paying the, they're, they're paying my salary. So um, I had a ball playing Jim, you know, I, I really did. And, uh, and then, you know, the movie, became then it was no longer 3d originally it was called the texas chainsaw massacre 3d mm -hmm. and then it was it, somehow they tested it 
And it turned out that the, the target audience didn't like the word massacre, which is like, what? I mean, it's, yeah, it's a horror well, movie. It's the safe space things. era. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they decided not to go with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So it became Texas Chainsaw 3D. So on the final posters, you'll see that Massacre got, you know, uh, canceled. And so, uh, but that was, you know, it was a fun, certainly I was only in the first, you know, five, six minutes of it, but uh, really had a ball. You know, loved, you know, that was the last time I worked with Gunner. That's he was piece. on it. Uh, Marilyn, Marilyn was on it. Uh, so, you know, there were a couple of us old, you know, chainsaw geezers. And uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun, certainly. I want to get into my favorite role of yours, Otis Driftwood, House of a Thousand Corpses. I know how you met Rob Zombie at the awards show. He eventually calls you a month later after you meet him at the awards show. Otis Driftwood. And th this role, you just completely take over. The lines in there are insane. How much free reign did Rob Zombie give you as far as the dialogue goes? Because I feel as though that you, th these were your lines directly. That's how I feel. Um, you know, not not so much. Uh, I didn't really have that much leeway um, on the first of them of the three uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. It was uh, it was Rob's first directing job. Uh, you know, big time back lot Universal Studios, Burbank, California. You know, we're shooting. We were shooting actually. The House of a Thousand Corpses was the uh, also the the same house that was used as the Chicken Ranch in uh, you know rhinestone cowboy so <laughs> i was like what and so we were right on actually the tram ride you know they there's the universal studios has uh has a, a tram tour and you know people go on it and they go oh, yeah and there's the psycho house and that's where you know jaws is filmed and then they would come by our place and i remember it one day just staggering out i had mr willis's skin and his chest his face his arms and i staggered out covered with blood it was the middle of the day, and uh, here comes this Universal Tour trim. And on your right is a uh, movie, new movie being made by Rob Z Rocker, Rob Zombie. It's called House of a Thousand Corpses. And I remember like waving with all this bloody skin on me, his skin suit. And uh, you know, people, I'm sure they took a few pictures, but they were, I think, <laughs> they were a little frightened. About it. It's like, what the hell is that? Uh, but anyway, so I so Rob was uh, you know Rob was had a pretty tight rein um, uh, at least on me uh, for uh, for Otis and uh, and it, and it's actually a good thing because I didn't really find Otis until probably about six weeks after we had finished shooting House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, we needed a few more extra scenes, and so we went to uh, Wayne Toth, the makeup guy's studio, and shot a few extra things and. Um, one of the things we shot is Otis in, in black and white saying, uh, hunting humans ain't nothing but nothing. They'll run like scared little rabbits. Run, rabbit, run, run, rabbit, run, rabbit. You know, did this crazy thing. And that was when it was like, oh, that's Otis. So that was really when I finally, you know, got Otis. I mean, I certainly had a lot of Otis, most of Otis throughout uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. But that's when it really like, okay. <laughs> And uh, so it, when it came time for Devil's Rejects, um, and I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. oh, I, yeah, I consider, you were. yeah, I consider House of a Thousand Corpses kind of, you know, kicking the tires. Yeah, I think I'll buy the car, you know. And then Devil's Rejects, I bought the car, I'm behind the wheel, and I'm, you know, out on the highway doing 100. Mm -hmm. At what point when working with Rob Zombie, did you realize that Rob Zombie was a great director and what separates him from all the other filmmakers in the business? Because he was a rock star and he came over and had to prove himself in the movie making business. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I just remember it in terms of scenes. Uh, you know, Rob was a lot of fun to work with because uh, he writes his own stuff. And so he knows he, he has already seen it in his head. So he already knows what he's looking for. Uh, and that makes it a, a his directing a lot more economical because, you know, if you're doing something, if you're doing the wrong thing, it doesn't take him a while. He, you know, he kind of guides you back on his, his path. Um, I also thought he was a great director when I was doing a scene where I come out, uh, where there are the, the cops have come, uh, it was Walton Goggins and Tommy Tolls, and they've showed up at our, at the, the house, the Firefly house. And, uh, and I come out from behind like a, some old washer dryer, 
And I have a gun on Walton Goggins. I say, you know, get on your knees, pig, or whatever I say. And uh, and 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 I, I walk out and I do that scene. And, you know, it was fine. It was perfectly okay. And then uh, Rob, Rob came over to me and said, that was great. That was good. Um, let's do it again. And this time, as you're coming out and saying the lines, why don't you scratch your belly? And, uh, you know, because I had a, I had a cowboy shirt with, a, you know, the tails out and everything. I just said, yeah, just do that and scratch your belly. And so I went, okay. So we did take two and I came out and, uh, you know, scratched my belly. And of course, then it's all about, that just indicates it's casual, you're under control, you know, you know, hit your knees. I've done this a thousand times, you know, just something about that opened up a whole different level or, a, you know, energy and uh i thought that's that's fucking cool (laughs) (laughs) that was pretty awesome that uh you know something like that i mean that that got my attention uh when he did uh devil's rejects then i really knew boy this guy is really something i mean he did a great job on house of a thousand corpses uh you know we did it for universal they thought it was too shocking and right around, right around then was 9-11. There was Columbine with kids, you know, shooting each other in high school. And so there was a lot of stuff that uh, politically that made Universal maybe not so excited about releasing House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, and so it, it took three years of wandering in the wilderness to finally get Lionsgate, get it released from Lionsgate. Um, and then we did um, Devil's Rejects and, uh, and Rob, that's when I thought he was really, really smart uh, because <laughs> he took the opportunity. And I, of course, I've been in Texas Chainsaw 2. I've been in remake of Night of the Living Dead. So, you know, these kind of, you know, second, you know, the, the, the second helpings of things. And a lot of times I'm also a big horror fan. So when I see, you know, a part two of something, a lot of times the cynical producers, believe it or not, uh, will kind of want to just do a remake of the same movie, kind of a rehash, uh, just because they, if they can get, you know, three quarters of the, the box office, their surprise hit made, they'll be happy. So, you know, there, there's really, you, a lot of times there isn't really a challenge to go farther with a sequel. I mean, really farther. And, um, and what Rob did was not only, he, he changed genres. I mean, he went from a, old dark house horror movie to kind of a violent crime road picture, almost a Western. It it was just, it wasn't like a classic horror movie. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, Otis and Otis, you know, in House House of a Thousand Corpses, you know, I'm I'm albino. So I have these black and red dotted eyes. And of course, you know, my skin is pale and, you know, weird Mr. Otis. (laughs) And then then for... (laughs) For, uh, for Devil's Rejects, uh, I remember Rob saying, well, I, I want you to ch- you're gonna change your look for Devil's Rejects. And I said, well, you know, I was at his house for a Super Bowl. We were just watching the Super Bowl, um, 2006, maybe, or whatever, 2007. And, and, uh, and he said, we're gonna do this and uh, we're gonna change. And, and I, I've got this new look for you. And I said, well, can you sketch it out for me? So he, he took a paper plate and sketched out Otis. And it looked kind of like, um, you know, it looked like uh, one of the Almond Brothers, and I said, "Well, dude, this this guy's got a beard." And he goes, "Yeah," and I said, "Well, I've never grown a beard," and and I said, "How do you grow a beard?" And Rob looked at me and said, "Stop shaving." I was like, "Oh, okay." So uh, I stopped shaving, and this beard came out of my face. It really shocked us all, and. Um, but that was really it, that, that Otis goes from Albino to Almond Brother, that Captain Spaulding wipes off his clown makeup and is basically without clown makeup the whole movie. Uh, Baby is no longer doing her laughs. I think she does it once and that's it. So it's a complete, you know, the characters morph, the, the genre morphs, everything about it changes. And uh, it really was, I was so impressed. I, I just was so happy to be a part of it, I got to say iconic as Quentin Quayle, AKA Dr. Satan. It's all true. The boogeyman is real. You found him. He Rob Zombie went in a different direction. Dr. Satan was a part of devil's rejects. Do you think that Rob Zombie will ever make a Dr. Satan film? Uh, that's a Rob Zombie question. I don't know. There was a Dr. Satan scene. 
That's right. And, in uh, Devil's Rejects, it was deleted where he rips the nur no, the nurse's throat out. Yeah. And uh, and he just thought that that didn't work. And also in Devil's Rejects, apparently, uh, uh, Tiny talks at the very toward the very end. And um, and that was in there. And then Rob decided, you know what, that's not going to work because that's too distracting. We've already got this, you know, this groove going on. We'll just have Tiny say no and, you know, shake his head and walk into the burning house. But uh, I just thought it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, quite a, you know, and it was a lot of work. Uh, you know, some people wonder if, it, if it's fun to do these movies. It is, uh, especially fun when you're like, you know, in the theater, <laughs> you know, after the fact, watching it and everybody's going, man, that was great. And you go, oh, you know, sure. But uh, when you're doing it, it's, you know, it's a lot of work. Also, I, I have two, you know, I had two young girls, you know, two young daughters at the time. And, uh, you know, you don't want to bring Otis back home. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I've learned how to leave it at the set for the most part. So that's, that, that's good. Iconic role for sure. Three from hell. Rest in peace to Sid Haig. I'd love to hear the first time that you got to meet with him, especially when he was in the Captain Spall and makeup. Rest in peace to him again. Yeah. Uh, well, that was actually the same. That was the time that uh, I think that Rob had it too. At the same time, it was the Edith Head wardrobe room over at um, uh, Universal Studios, and uh, and Sid had gotten into the clown costume for Captain Spaulding, and that was the first time I met him because uh, I was there getting fitted for Otis, and uh, and uh, it was a hoot. You know, he was very. He was you know. Big guy, you know, he's like maybe 6'3", I think. Uh, a big guy, obviously he'd been around the block. Uh, he was a load, loads of fun when we did a, uh, a read through. Um, you know, we did, before we shot the movie, we, we, you know, the whole cast showed up and Michael J. Pollard and Karen Black, you know, obviously Rob, Sherry, Sid, me, and, um, so we, uh, you know, we had a, we had a ball. We we kind of we got along pretty much from from the beginning. There was there, there was kind of a friendly rivalry, and there was always that tension, which was a kind of a good tension between uh, me and Captain Spaulding. Uh, you know, you know, and and uh, some of it boiled over a little bit. You know, not not ever off screen, but on screen. Let's say in the Kihiki Palms Motel Room. You know, we're kind of at each other. Uh, but you know, the beautiful thing was that. Um, when uh, when the movie was right at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, uh, and we're about to uh, we I, I'm driving the car and, and Spalding and and Baby are in the back seat. We're all pretty pretty beaten up and shot up, and uh, we come around a corner and there is the Rugsville Sheriff's Department arrayed against us with rifles aimed, and um, and we kind of you know we had that moment of like oh, okay and. Uh, and we just, you know, there's that kind of tacit agreement. Okay, we're going for it. This is this is it. And and so I had a couple of guns on the seat in front of me in the, the passenger seat. I had a rifle. I had uh, it was like it was a shotgun maybe and a couple of pistols. And I remember handing one pistol back to Baby. And of course, my hands are all you know they you know Forsyth has driven nails into my hands, so I'm not really the best, <laughs> best shape. And uh, but anyway, but there it comes down to uh, there's a shotgun and a, and a pistol and there's Sid and there's me. And I remember thinking in that moment, it wasn't in the script. This is just, you know, in the moment um, that uh, the guy with the shotgun, it's like, you know, it's got the bigger dick kind of thing. And uh, and so I remember, you know, looking back at Sid and looking back at Sherry and just thinking, I love that guy. And, uh, and so I made a choice to, you know, give him the shotgun. And, uh, and, and there was, and as I handed it back to him, we had a moment, we had a look and, you know, cameras can't always catch everything, but we had a look and understood in that moment, you know, this was my, I was honoring him. Um, and then, uh, you know, I pick up the gun, gun the car and off we go to, apparent annihilation but <laughs> <laughs> and you came back and we get free from hell <laughs> yeah right. we beat the odds <laughs> oh you, you were rejected and that and that's what happened <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious to know your favorite line is otis driftwood uh you know it's there's so many of them um 
you know, hope it don't rest the barrels. You know, barrels certainly is a good one. Uh, I am the devil. I'm here to do the devil's work. Um, you know, I want lightning to come down and crash upon my fucking head. You know, there's a lot of stuff there. So, uh, yeah, you can really take your pick. Uh, mm -hmm. Ain't no ice cream in your fucking future. You know, there's so <laughs> many to choose from. I, I was, and that was, that was Sid's improv, you know, you know, tutti fucking fruity and, you know, come on, you know, and we were just having so much fun in that moment. And then, uh, and then at one point, you know, Sherry's got, come on, don't be such a, don't be such a sourpuss. And she holds this ice cream cone and I, I, I turn my head and, you know, get some ice cream on my nose and uh, in one take. <laughs> and of course, that's the one that Rob, you know, chose because that's, you know, you know, he wanted it, you know, that that is the turning point in terms of, you know, a family squabble, um, you know, like everybody gets pissed at each other in long car trips and, uh, you know, nobody's going to stop for ice cream and then he does and, you know, it's just like, you know, so that's, that's when I think the audience kind of started loving us instead of hating us. Yeah, iconic role. I want to congratulate you on your new film and get this in, make sure the audience is, is tuned in and, and watches this film, Prisoners of Ghostland. Congratulations on that, that just released. Yeah, it just came out last weekend. Yeah. Uh, yes, starring Nicolas Cage, and the one and only, and uh, Sophia Butella, uh, who, was, who played the mummy in the Tom Cruise mummy. And she was like the hot, dark haired chick in the bar fight and the bathroom fight in Atomic Blonde. I mean, she is fantastic. She's a, a danced for many years with Madonna, so she did a great job. Um, Nick Cassavetes is in it. Um, so yeah, and of course we shot it in Japan uh, back in uh, November, December of 2019, and with the great Japanese director Sion Sono, S I O N S O N O. And if you guys ever get a you know chance to check his movies out. Uh, you know, he's done some amazing movies in Japanese, you know, they're dubbed or not dubbed, but, uh, you know, subtitles, uh, but movies called, uh, one is called Suicide Club. If you want to start there, it's pretty awesome. Uh, Tokyo Tribe, Hair Extensions, uh, Anti-Porno, uh, Why Don't You Play in Hell, uh, and one of my faves, Tag, and my supreme favorite, Cold Fish. So if you're into, you know, if you're into Takashi Miike, you know, I'm kind of extreme, crazy Japanese horror action adventure kind of stuff, uh, you know, check, check out Science and, and definitely check out Prisoners of the Ghost Land. It's, it's on the big screen now and, and it's streaming as well, but if you can see it big, it's epic. So I would recommend that. 100%. And any other up and coming work that you have, I believe I read online that you have something with Kane Hodder releasing next year. I did read that. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I really don't know. I just did a movie called The Chastiser, um, and that probably will come out in, in a couple of months. Um, I also did a movie. Uh, I had a movie, actually, it, it screened last night. The first time I saw it, uh, it was in Denver last night. Um, it's a movie called Sin Eater, S-I-N, you know, Eater. And um, I play a Catholic priest, uh, you know, exercising, trying to exorcise uh, the demon, the sex demon from a 14 year old girl. So that's always, always good. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Don't try that at home, by the way. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Bill Mosley, is there anything else you'd love to let the audience know here today? Uh, you know, it's at Chop Top Mosley. That's, you know, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, and I, again, I'm working on a new Spider Mountain CD. So that should be coming out one of these days. It's really, it's getting good. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be, let's see, next weekend. Oh my God, October 1st through 3rd, I'm going to be in Bangor, Maine wow. at the, uh, you know, uh, Bangor Comic Con and a bunch of other conventions uh, now that we're apparently kind of getting around COVID and you know, I still wear a mask. I've been, I got a couple of Moderna's. So, uh, you know, I feel good, but uh, so that the conventions are starting to, you know, come back a little bit. Um, so I'm, and of course, you know, October is coming up, man. It's my busy month. Yeah, of course. Is. You're, <laughs> you're a horror icon. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. Bill Mosley, I, I really appreciate your time and doing this interview with me. You're always welcome on the show. Anytime you need to come on and talk about a new movie, you're always welcome on. Thanks a lot, DJ Mad Max. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, go Redman.
Oh, yes, of course. You already know. <laughs> Take care. Enjoy the rest of your night. Stay safe. All enjoy right. your October and Halloween. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night, Bill Mosley. Bye. Bye.